chapter 4. You know, when you look at this and you study through the whole book, you think you're going to be here a year. And, and you never know. We're already halfway through Ephesians chapter 4. And this halfway point is really a turning point in this book and in our study. Because we have been sharing a lot of doctrine. It's been doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. And now you see the first two verses, the first two words of Ephesians 4.1 and Paul says, I therefore, that is a sign of a turning point that we have here. When he says, therefore, that is encapsulating all three chapters of what we've shared so far concerning the doctrine that we have learned. And we have learned a lot of delightful doctrine. What we're going to share for the last three chapters is going to be our duty now as children of God. The Christian conduct in our lives and the way we are to live our lives now. We began, as we look through the doctrine in the beginning of this book, we talked about how rich we are in Christ, uh, a holy life. That's been given to us. The manner by which we're saved. We're adopted by Jesus Christ. We have assurance of our salvation. We are accepted already in the beloved. We have been redeemed. Our lives have been bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are forgiven for all of our sins, our past, present and future sins. We are inheritors of heaven. We're, we're joint heirs with Christ. And he's going to share everything with us in heaven. We have eternal things waiting on us there. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The, the witness of the Spirit in our hearts telling us that there's more to come. And you are assured of everything in eternity. We, our conversation is already in heaven. We already know that we're citizens of heaven right now. We have learned these doctrines. We have learned that we were dead in our sins before we were saved. But we have been quickened, made alive by the Holy Spirit of God. We have gone from dead in sin to alive unto God. We've gone from gloom to the gift of salvation. We understand. We have a doctrine. We understand. That we can't earn our salvation. It's a gift given by the Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Praise God for the gift of salvation. And we know we have it. The grace of God. Paul led Ephesus as well as us to we take this personally that we remember what we were. And we rejoice in who we are now. We're a new creation. We're changed when we're saved. The former things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we know we've been changed. We have been Brought to God by the blood of the cross. We have been reconciled by Jesus Christ. God built a bridge with whatever it took for that cross, if you will. That we could have a way to God. The Lord saves all over the earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God is saving all over this earth. And the family of God is from all over. And Paul recently revealed a mystery that the Gentiles are in the body of Christ with the Jews. They would be in church with the Jews. They would worship together. And so so all races and all faces, God is saving them and they're coming into the family of God and they're and we're coming into the church together. Paul has prayed for their Receptiveness of this. Spiritual blessings. 
By the power of God. Spiritual power upon their lives. And that they may know every single benefit and every single blessing that the Lord has in store for them now. That they would know everything that God has for them now. That they know that heaven is their home, but they have benefit now for their lives so that they can live rich. It's one thing to know we're rich. It's another thing to live rich. And the two go together. You know, we've shared some delightful doctrine. Doctrine is the teaching of the Bible. And it's good to know what we believe. This, this book has come to us, given by God in a certain order. It's no mistake that we've shared doctrine first and now we're going to go into duty because the learning and embracing and the knowing of what we believe is going to affect us in our behavior. I've read emails and shared emails from some of you, talked to some of you after service and and you believe all of these blessed benefits that we have. In Jesus Christ. You believe in this eternal salvation in Jesus. And and all of the blessings that God has given to us. And it's very, very important that we know what we believe. There's a connection we find in God's truth. And that is, it's going to dictate our behavior. Belief results in behavior. So there's a great importance we see here in this. The last three chapters are going to be about our behavior as Christians. In order to behave right, we must first believe right. We're going from positional truth. We're positioned in Christ and we've learned this and we know this. And now we're going to share the practice of truth. We know who we are in Christ We know what we have in Christ. Now we're going to share what we are to be doing in Christ. So let's look at the path in verse 1. We're going to share verses 1 through 3 tonight. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. As we look at this path, we see the path is walking worthy. But let's first look at who is writing this and the example that he is. The Apostle Paul, he says, I, a prisoner of the Lord. Now, Paul has already told us that some statements back. We've divided it up. Man's divided up in chapters. I'm I'm glad we have so I can find things easier. But you look there in chapter 3, verse 1, and Paul has already said he's a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. Now, as he gets to this point, he again says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. You think he wants some attention? You think he's wanting sympathy? That doesn't fit. That doesn't fit with the Apostle Paul at, at all. He is not wanting attention to self, but he is wanting attention to the power of knowing what you believe. The power of the doctrine, it moved him more than the environment of the dungeon, if you will, that he was placed in. The walk that Paul is on, it, it, it's very active right now as he is writing He has been put in prison, but there's a call to walk worthy of the Lord. And he's writing to churches and he's encouraging churches. And don't you know, he's been witnessing throughout the prison. A lot of people were scared and a lot of preachers, they winced whenever Paul was put in prison for preaching Jesus Christ. And he says, hey, be encouraged by my don't faint by my bonds. The gospel is alive and well, and my ministry is alive and well. So Paul, 
He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord and he is not hindered whatsoever by the chains that he is in. He is suffering in lockdown, but there's something that this shows us as we're going to look at a worthy walk that we're to be a part of. We see something here that the power of Christ is greater than any condition That our lives can get in. So this worthy walking we're about to get into. There's there are no absentee slips that that are okay for an excused absence. We're never to deny our duty as a disciple of Christ. There is something continuous for us as we serve the Lord. I tell you what, God's using Paul to write this and Paul is wearing the shoes that he's telling us to fill and to walk in. There's a challenge that's given to you and I. It's given to Ephesus. It's personal to you and I as well. And Paul's chains carry a lot of weight in this. Because God's using Paul to write and he is showing us through Paul. He is the example that we are to walk worthy. Paul could have could have used prison as an excuse, but he didn't. You know, Paul, you know, being arrested by man. It it shows no effect when we look in the word of God. But Paul being arrested by Jesus Christ Shows great effect. Paul is a prisoner. Not not in that jail. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He is as free as he can be. Behind those walls. Serving the Lord. And walking worthy. Paul is an example. That there's no excusing. Ourselves from duty. But let's look at the exhortation. From this prisoner of the Lord. I therefore. Prisoner of the Lord. Beseech you. That ye walk worthy. Of the vocation. Wherewith ye are called. Paul is beseeching the church. That that word beseech. It means to call. It means to admonish. It means to exhort. Paul is instructing them in their day to day behavior and what it can be and what it should be as a child of God that we're to walk worthy. Let me define it this way. Our lives are to progress to be more and more like Jesus Christ all the time. That's the power. That's the blessing from the doctrine of knowing who we are and what we have in Christ. We have that confidence. We know that now we can fulfill our duty and we become more like the Lord as we grow as children of God. Paul has given them this exhortation to be more like the Lord Christ. And this is an order from heaven. It's not an order to get to heaven. That's not the subject. The subject isn't salvation. It's Christian conduct here. But it's an order from heaven that's given to Paul to be given to Ephesus for us too. But think about it a minute. This exhortation, it's for Paul too. Paul's life is to be of worthy walking before the Lord. So as we look at how Paul beseeches them, this is a command. It's a demand from our God that our conduct match up with what we believe. But there's some more defining of this word beseeching. It means to call alongside and it means to encourage. I see where this fits here since Paul is in this with them. He is he is an apostle and God's using him as an authority to give the word. But Paul is also encouraging them in this. He's the example and he's alongside them to walk in this worthy walking as well. Paul was a true friend. He was a true friend that you wanted around. Paul did everything he could to help a Christian To become more like Jesus. 
to help them in their walk. There was no competitive Christianity with Paul. There was no competition for him in, in preaching or being a preacher. He was willing to help anyone to be exalted. To be the very best they could be as a child of God. In any way that God would use him to assist another Christian in being more like Jesus. So the word of God comes from the authority given to Paul as the Holy Spirit spoke through him. But the exhortation is from a friend who's being a great example to this church. He's beseeching them that they would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Every child of God is called to walk worthy. That word called, it means invitation. Praise God as we look at this salvation, this eternal salvation in Christ in the first half of this book and all that we have in Christ. There's an open invitation for anyone to have their sins forgiven, for anyone to know Christ, for anyone to have these promises and all of these blessings and in eternity with the Lord for trusting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's an open invitation for all. And then we are called to live worthy. Let us consider that, that old balancing scale. I, I like old items. Every now and then I find something really old in good shape and I just I just pick it up and I, I think it's kind of neat. And I, I would like to have a balancing scale. That's not a hint for you to to look for one for me. I, I, I'm picky and I'm going to look for my own. It's not. I said something about a suit one time and and somebody took it as a as a that I was fishing to try to get a new suit out of some. You have to be careful what you say. But anyway, to think of a balancing scale. And and so we have the first half of this book and and we have this doctrine, this this weighty truth of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's another side of the scale. And I liken this unto a balanced Christian life. Because we, we have these truths of doctrine. We know what we believe. And it's to turn into a behavior. Doctrine on one side and duty on the other. That is what Paul is looking to balance out in the lives of these Christians, okay? So consider one side doctrine, one side duty. Now, as I say that, we're not earning anything at all. We're not, we do not earn salvation. We're not working our way to heaven. The idea of walking worthy is not the idea of, of trying to get to heaven. It's because we're going to heaven and we're moved by what we know in that. And we're called to a duty now. So, so the subject isn't salvation, it's Christian conduct. But, and as we look at these scales, the balancing of the scales of doctrine and duty, it leads to a balanced Christian life. When we have balance, we don't have hypocrisy. We have been saved by Christ, we've been redeemed by Christ, and now... We're called to represent Christ. We're ambassadors of Christ. We have a message to preach. Be ye reconciled to God. That's for every Christian to be a minister of the gospel and represent Christ to all. And we represent him by our conduct and the manner in which we live our lives. Our belief is to affect our behavior. And it's to balance out the scales to balance us as Christians. We're to live our lives for the Lord and we're to do it in the, the best that we can by the divine aid that is given to us. It's very important to obey the Lord's command to walk worthy. There is a path before us that is given to walk worthy and we can do that. Others have done that. We see in God's word where there are others who have done that. 
We see the word worthy here. And in the heroes of faith chapter of the Bible, Hebrews 11, we find that word worthy again. I've looked over that point so many times. Most people have looked over completely the end of Hebrews 11. It's wonderful to rejoice in how Moses did this and that by faith. And Abraham had these spiritual successes by faith. And, and Sarah and, and Rahab. And it goes on and on. And we rejoice in that. But we go to the end of Hebrews chapter 11. And it talks about those who were try, who uh, had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. Uh, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Verse 37 of Hebrews 11. There were those who were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Tempted. They were slain with the sword. Sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. Being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And I'll be honest. I just kind of. My focus went down to verse 39. How they had obtained a good report through faith. I don't want to sidetrack too much, but that just really deletes a doctrine that's out there that all you have to have is enough faith. If you just believe, you just have faith and believe everything will be OK. Well, no, this happened to these Christians and they had a good report through faith. Jesus says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. So don't believe that doctrine of, oh, I just have to have enough faith. That's people that have faith in faith. And they won't share the end of Hebrews chapter 11. But, but getting to the point here. These who did not receive the promise. And they experienced all of these things. Having a good report through faith. In verse 38. It says of whom the world was not worthy. What made that standing for them. Of such a worth over the world. And they were taken out of this world. God having some better thing for them. Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt too. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But these, the world was not worthy of them. That word worthy is the same word that we're sharing in Ephesians in the text tonight. They demonstrated Christ likeness in their life. They lived for the glory of God. They expressed Christ in their life. They became more and more like Jesus. They displayed the Savior's power and the grace of God. And they had a balanced Christian life. The scales were evened up. There was something of equal value on the other side of that scale. See, we have salvation in Christ and we have the promises of Christ. And then by the power of Christ, we're given a new life to live. We're able to live according to a conduct that is powered from heaven. Only the child of God can walk worthy. And that's something weighty. Because Jesus saves us and then Jesus sets us apart and we we follow the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are consumed by the Holy Spirit and we are we are led and influenced by him. And so we have a life now that can balance the scales as we daily yield to the spirit of God. I, I don't know if this is ever going to take with people because people don't like to hear that they can't live the Christian life. But that's what I say. People don't live the Christian life, but the Holy Spirit does within you and I. We are the vessel that the ministry of the Spirit of God through our lives will live for the glory of God. The Spirit of God is in complete agreement with the Word of God, with God the Father, with God the Son. God the Spirit leads us to live the Christian life and balances out the scales when we yield to Him. This is our duty, walking worthy, Christ-like conduct. It's my duty, and it's your duty as a child of God. And it's our duty together 
as a church. And it's very important that we have this togetherness. And that's going to come into play toward the end of this. But let's go from the path to the practice. The practice of a character in our lives. He says that along with walking worthy, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Here we see the character for the child of God that we're to live by that goes along with this conduct. There's a fitting conduct for the child of God that has been given to us. And the character that goes along with it is the first one there is lowliness. Sunday night, we talked about walking humbly with thy God. It's a requirement that the Lord has given us. And this word lowliness is closely related to humility. We're to walk worthy in lowliness. What's being said here is walking humbly with thy God. What the Bible says in one place, it's going to say again, and it's going to say again, and it may say it several times. The Bible backs up the Bible. People question the Bible and question what things mean. Look, the more you get into the Bible... And just see those other truths. The Bible protects the Bible, if you will. It doesn't matter who God used to, to pin it down. The Holy Spirit pinned it. And, and it, the Bible protects the Bible. And where it says something one time, it's going to say it again. And so we're to walk in humility. We're to have, we're to have lowliness to... Be lowly in character. It involves you and I seeing God as he is. And you and I seeing ourselves as we really are. We must do this because we talked about it Sunday night. We're very susceptible to pride. I mean, it's it's a it's in the flesh. It, it'll happen. We're susceptible to pride. We're tempted to be self-confident. But we attack pride by seeing that God is all of our righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. Isaiah said all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's all we could offer God on our own. But he is our righteousness. We sing this is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. We need to keep that in check because that attacks pride when it tries to rise up in us. We consider the salvation that we have and how much the Lord loves us. And the truth is, we don't deserve a bit of it. That's why I don't mind singing such a worm as I. But we we know what we are without Christ. Without him we're nothing. So we see here that we don't deserve what he's given to us. And and I tell you what, that's how that's how we walk in lowliness. We have to see the truth of this lowliness. It's not a false humility. It's not a false humility of criticizing ourselves. It's simply taking ourselves out of the picture completely. It's not about us. When we're walking lowly, it's about Christ and it's about others when we live and we walk lowly in life there. We not only see lowliness as a practice in character, but we see meekness too. meekness is not being a sissy. That's not what meekness is. Meekness is not sissiness. I don't know if that's a word. I make up a word every now and then, but you get the point. Meekness is not sissiness. It's actually about strength. About strength that is maintained under control. You know, it's, that's, that's the harder thing to do. 
It's easy to act out in any old way. But when strength is kept under control, that's being meek. And, and the display is gentleness. And the display is kindness and mildness as that strength is under control. I wish a Christian would have come to my mind as an example. And I know many and many could. But you know what came to my mind is my example is my my Doberman Pinscher I had when I was a little kid. I would say I used to take him for a walk, but he took me for a walk. And that was one big, strong dog. And I remember as a kid, I used to I used to grab him by the cheek. I would I would grab his whiskers. That dog never laid a tooth in me or a paw on me. He could have. He could have taken me out. But he, he never did that. He never touched me. We may know how to put somebody in their place. But meekness is the control to give things over to Christ. To walk in meekness. That's a spiritual product. I, I know what we can do in the flesh. And that's easy. It's not impressive. And we've repeated ourselves. But we don't have to. We can walk in meekness. And give it over to the Lord. And none of us can say I can't do that. I, I think I'm an exception. We can't say that. Because meekness is a fruit of the spirit. And the one who is saved. Has received the Holy Spirit, the moment they were saved, and the byproduct, the fruit, the results of the Spirit living and manifesting through our lives, one thing is going to be meekness. Another thing we see here by way of character is long suffering. Let me give you this definition of long suffering tonight not having a short fuse. That's what it means to be long suffering. I'm so thankful that our Lord Jesus Christ is long suffering. And three decades and, and then I was saved. You know, some overreact when there's a problem. But you see others who will just steadily wade through it. They will never give up. They will never complain. They will continue on. Sometimes the problem is a person. And you have those Christians who are long suffering. Who, who stand behind someone till they just can't stand anymore. They're, they're patient with others. And that's the character that you and I can have. Never giving up. Never complaining. How about forbearance? How about giving you this definition of this character trait? Forbearance. Loving people instead of trying to change them. Forbearing one another in love. Now people need changing. Christians need changing every day. But that's not our job to try to change someone. The preacher can't change anybody. The preacher's called to preach the word. And that's God's business. And that's Christ's work to change a person. You know who, you know who can be changed that we can be a part of changing? Our, ourselves. Ourselves with Christ. I learned that lesson with someone that I dearly love. When I realized I couldn't change them and, and when I looked at myself... Instead of them, I, I saw I was in a worse condition. And, and God was, was able to do a, a great work to help me out. I'm not where I ought to be, but I'm not where I was. We can have that change come about in ourselves. And we can forbear one another in love. Truth be told, we're not only forbearing others, but others are forbearing us in love we need others to be patient with us just as we are with others we need tolerance for one another and loving one another all along the way I, I tell you what oh how we need more of that and and heaven has it for you and I but let's go 
to the peace now that we see in verse 3. We've seen the path, walking worthy. We see the practice, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And now let's look at the peace in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. A big, big portion, a big important topic of what we're sharing here tonight is unity, actually. Haven't mentioned it yet till now, because as I studied, I looked back and I just said, wow, look how all this starts falling in place. We're to live our lives for the glory of God. We're to walk worthy for the glory of God. We're to be influenced by the Holy Spirit in our lives for the glory of God. But there's something very, very important to God that comes about as a result of this. And that is unity in the church. You'd be hard pressed to find when God had a letter to a church and he didn't emphasize unity. Unity is something extremely important for the children of God in the family of God. We have a part in this. Look what it says. Endeavoring to keep the unity. God has given us a part. And, and what this means here, it's the idea of exerting ourselves diligently and zealously in the maintaining of unity in the church. That's one of the most important things in the church. A church can hide a lot of problems from guests who come in, maybe. But when, there, when there's division, that's pretty easy to detect. We depend on unity to be a church. It's very important for us from God. And he gives us he gives us this duty in it. It's of high importance to God and we're to put constant effort toward it. The most impacting quality a church is going to have is the unity that exists within it. We don't get unity. The Lord gives that. But when it does come about, when the Lord does create that among his people, he saves people. He puts them together in an assembly together and he gives unity. And we're to be ever so sensitive to the maintaining of that unity. It ought to be something that we think about all the time. It ought to dictate our actions with the church. That we would do things to edify and to unify one among another. That's going to take yielding to the spirit for us to maintain this unity. That's our part. It's our part to maintain that, to keep that. That word keep there, it means to hold or to guard the unity that we have. And if that's our part... What cannot be our part would be members thinking they're more important than other members. What cannot be our part is wanting to persuade others with our opinion for, for what we're going to do or decisions we're going to make. Just, just based on opinions. We can't glorify our opinions. We can't be wanting our own way over others. Church of Philippi had a problem with that. And they almost split right down the middle. I've said this many times before, and I'm sure I'll say it many times in the future. I don't know if Kimberly remembers me saying this years ago, but there are no big eyes and little U's in Christianity. God is no respecter of persons. No members are more important than others. We're all different. And I tell you what, different is good. Different can be good. I mean, we all have different things to do in the church. Not everyone can play the piano. Well, no one denied, but not everyone can do it at one time. You know, differences are good. 
Because there's more than good, one good idea for decisions we need to make. And people bring things from different angles. And the church can, can go with what, what the church agrees on overall. We can feed off of one another's differences. Differences can cause some problems, though, as well. You know, there, there are mental differences. There are emotional differences. But, and we all have differences. But none are more important than what we have in common in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we, you know what? I, I really, I really loved those first three chapters. I love sharing everything we have in Christ. I, I love how people seem to love hearing about how rich they are in Christ and everything we have. And we all share that together. And there's nothing more important in life than what we have in Christ with one another. I tell you what, it's made a bond. It, it binds us together, what we have in Him. And so the attention given here and what our effort is to be on in diligence are the things we can do that create unity. The things that help us in unity one with another. Hey, it's a very fragile thing. It's a very fragile thing for you and I. So we're all to do our part to walk worthy, to walk in the character and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we're to walk together. Our individual lives should be becoming more and more like Jesus. But when we all do. We're able to have that unity together and we not only see. Our part, but we see our power to do so. Endeavoring to keep the un keep the unity. Of the spirit. You know, the Trinity was in unity to bring you and I salvation. God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit, all in unity that we might be saved. And with that unity, the ministry now of God, the Holy Spirit is empowering us to carry out this command that the scales would be balanced, that they would be weighty on both sides, not only with what we believe and knowing what we believe, but that turning into the way we live our lives and that we become more like Christ. Every day. And that's binding. That's binding for us. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. In the bond. Of peace. The church. Depends on unity. That. That's to be very high up. On the list for us. We're to think about it. And all we do. The family of God is. It's, it's very fragile. It's a very delicate thing we're to see. And we're to be constantly very diligent. In whatever we can do. By way of the spirit. To develop unity one with another. Well. We're going to get into a lot more behavior. And. It's wonderful to know. That we can have the confidence. That we can do so. Because of Christ in us. God does not put things before us that we can't reach, that we can't do. Anything He gives us to do, He enables us to do. He's a good Father, and He's a wonderful Savior, and He empowers the children of God to live for His glory. Corey, would you come on up tonight and close us in a word of prayer, brother?